and welcome back to Shabbat Night Live. We are continuing with our guests. We have a ton of great things to talk about with Kevin Fisher. Kevin, you are the president of Arc Discovery International. Your website is arcdiscovery.com. Obviously, we're going to talk about Arc things coming up, uh, yes. Arc of the Covenant, Noah's Ark, and we've talked about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah in our last episode. Today, we're going to be talking mainly about, in this section, the Red Sea Crossing something that's close to Michael's heart. Uh, we've got a photo of it behind us, and you have a video you'd like to share with us, uh, and you're going to tell us what's going on there. Yes. Before we start the video, we have a map here of the Sinai Peninsula, Okay. where the children of Israel, they left Egypt proper, which will be over in the Cairo area, for instance, and they traveled east across the Sinai, and then they were told to turn south, which that brought them down through the Wadi Watur, through the mountains, and then the Wadi Watur emptied out onto this large beach that we see on the east side of the Sinai Peninsula on and the western, is, western edge of the Gulf of Aqaba. And that is Nueva. That's Nueva, and that's where we're headed to. That's the Red Sea Crossing site. So in our video here, we're going to go down to Nueva from two different directions. We'll first start out here in Cairo, and then uh, from there, we'll head over to Nueva. And then in the second part of the video, We'll be heading down from Elat, Israel, down to Nueva. So here we're starting out in Cairo, and we're driving through the city here. You can see it's quite large. You see the minarets and so forth in the background. So you're literally going to take us to Sinai in your yes, car. Yes, yes. All right, this is great. This is the route. We're going to actually travel almost the route that the children of Israel took, crossing the Sinai and going over to the Red Sea crossing. Here in the background, you can see a large ancient castle there in Cairo. Of course, they have a lot of history compared to the United States. Yes, hundreds um, and hundreds of yeah. years, if not thousands, yes. obviously thousands of years there. And so there's a mosque that we're driving by. Our taxi's taking us to our hotel at this point. But uh, again, more of this large ancient castle there. And so the next morning from atop our hotel, we're looking down on the streets there in Cairo and you can see the old world and the new world together. We see this donkey cart next to the traffic zooming by. and uh, Much like what you see in Jerusalem with the old, uh, yes. old and new city. Yes, yeah. right. So the, the poor and, uh, and then the rich, you know, also. So uh, from here, we're going to be taking a look across the city. From this vantage point, you can look across the city here. And atop these type of condos they have there, apartments, a lot of the locals would bring animals on top of the rooftop. Why, why do they do that? Such as chickens and goats. Okay. So on top of these apartments, you can look down and see goats and chickens, and you can hear them. Here you are in a city, and you can hear <laughs> you know, chickens and goats, and here you can see a goat here on top of the building. Uh, Pasture on the rooftop. Yes, okay. and so, you know, they... Uh, from trash, a lot of these goats, they feed them trash. So from okay. trash, they end up with milk and, and meat, you know, if they slaughter the animal. Lovely. But yeah, <laughs> <Trash> exactly. <milk. laughs> right. And so from here, we're going to look south, and in the distance, as we zoom in, we can see the pyramids at Giza, the Great Pyramid, mm. and so forth, right here next to the city. It's quite amazing that you could see the pyramid is right next to the city from that a distance. That is quite a sight. Yeah. So uh, a lot of history here going back. And so we're headed south. We can see the bent pyramid in the distance. We got our taxi taking us down to the step pyramid. And there it is. This is the pyramid that Joseph built, Why Wyatt thought. And the National Geographic, they mentioned some inscriptions along the Nile River where it mentioned that Imhotep had saved his country from a seven-year famine. Hmm. So does that sound kind of like Joseph? That is a little familiar, isn't yes. it? Yes. So Imhotep built this pyramid. It's considered the first and oldest pyramid in Egypt. Wow. He built it for his king, Zoser. But at this complex are some underground vertical silos, which held grain. You know, during the seven years of plenty, they had to store the grain someplace. So a great place to store it would be underground where it's cooler. You know, the grain would last longer. And so at this complex here are a series of underground vertical silos. 
Now they had to bring the grain up, and so there's one exit point for these silos. And this is the exit point where they would go down and get the first grain out. The first grain that went in came out first, first in, first out. And so they went down these steps and carried the grain up in you know, bags of grain. So Joseph was able to save his country so it's the uh, ancient, uh, ancient best before date system. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so uh, this made you know, Egypt very rich, the mm. sale of the grain. So in our graphic again here, the map, we're going to go across the Sinai and we're going to turn south and go through the mountains to the Red Sea crossing site. That's our destination. But uh, you know, Solomon's seaport was on the northern tip of the Gulf of Aqaba at Elat, according to 1 Kings 9.26, and it termed this body of water as Yam Suf, or the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. That is the body of water we're heading over to, the Gulf of Aqaba. And as we're heading east out of Cairo, we're taking our taxi, and we encounter the uh, Suez Canal that we've all heard of. And along the way here, we have to go underneath the Suez Canal. There's a tunnel going underneath the Suez. It's over a mile in length. Uh, That's one way of uh, going through the waters on dry ground, yes, I suppose. Yes. <laughs> so uh, our driver's taking us through the tunnel here, and we've got an abbreviated video segment of it as we enter. And it's a quite nice, but it is a small you know, two-lane tunnel. But then we come out the other side after driving over a mile, and we have just left Africa, and we're now in Asia. And we're going to go across the Sinai Peninsula, similar to the route that the children of Israel took. And Albeit not on asphalt. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> right. Along the way, we saw this truck in front of us that said, I love Jesus. Of course, we're in a Muslim country. But uh, we thought that was interesting. That's very gutsy. In uh, yeah, right, right. And so we went through some checkpoints on the way, going through. Were you ever questioned about your video uh, along the way by those in the checkpoints? Well, usually our driver would tell us to put the cameras down. <laughs> Probably yeah. a wise choice. Yeah, <laughs> right. We don't want to be hauled off to jail. No. So along the way, you see the, all the flat terrain. You know, this would enable them to travel more quickly across the Sinai, you know, they want to get out of Dodge as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And three million people in tow, if not yes, more. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So again, we're taking a video of different segments along the way. Again, you see the flat terrain as we're heading further east. And again, this may be an area where we kind of headed south. And again, you see a really flat area where the children of Israel would have journeyed through here. They would have never suspected that they would be entangled in the desert, as the word says, uh, encountering an Awadi Watir after seeing yes, this. I'm sure a lot of the men that knew the area, when they turned south, they became concerned, you know, where is Moses taking us? Right. But uh, Well, as Michael Rood points out in his video, Nueva, in the beach, you're, you're pretty much cornered. You've got yes. you know, wilderness to one direction and armies to the other. Yes, right, right. And so in this area, we're getting closer to the Wadi Watur that goes through the mountains. Again, the flat, nice terrain. And here's the beginning of the Wadi Watur. It's, it's a wider area, but you see the mountains on the right and the left. Mm. And uh, plenty of room through here. It's a nice, generous, wide area. You almost wonder if they thought, great, we're going to be hidden in here, and that's, that's going to be a good thing. Yes. But uh, was not but the case. <laughs> they found out later, yeah, they came to a stop. So here's the wadi we're going to travel through to get to the large beach there. And this is where it will exit later. Mm. This is from Google Earth. Can you imagine getting millions of people through there? That would have been a feat in It itself. became tight at some point. But in the distance, we see the mountain we'll head to later in our next segment, Mount Sinai, over in Saudi Arabia. But uh, you can see the orientation of the crossing site to the Mount Sinai in this graphic here. So here we are, we're going through the Wadi Watur. We see the mountains. This is a nice wide area that we stopped. And, and it's still fairly passable here. Yes. It does not look like a threat at all. Right. But as it gets narrow, we can see here it's much narrower. 
and things were a bit congested. And there is nothing there. I mean, no wonder they were concerned. There's no food, there's no water. Yes. Just a bunch of rock. And right. so... And you can't go, you can't take your wagons over top of these mountains no. here. Look how steep this is. We have to remember, there's no asphalt in that day. I mean, there's no smooth road. They're feeling every mm. bump. They're <laughs> yes. Likely twisting ankles, trying to get away yeah, so fast. Exactly. And so, winding our way through this narrow area, it gets more and more narrow. Here we make a turn through a narrow spot. And I think we may pan up at some point. And you can see how steep these large mountains are. So it says in Exodus 14, they're tangled in the land, the wilderness hath shut them in. So Exodus is telling us they're going through the Wadi Watur, they feel all shut in, they're entangled, you know, they're winding their way through these narrow mountains. And yeah, for those who argue a different crossing point, that verse would not make sense. Right. Where are they going right. to be literally entangled? Yes, and you can see how steep it is. Very steep there. We we shot up there. And again, yep. very narrow. You're not going to go over top of these mountains. But Josephus said, For there was on each side a ridge of mountains that terminated at the sea, which were impassable by reason of their roughness, and obstructed their flight. So again, he is agreeing with what the Bible is saying about the mountains. And even with more detail that yeah, would further prove. That is terminating at the sea. Mm -hmm. And here we're getting closer to the exit point, closer to the beach where they'll come to a stop. In the distance are the end of the mountains. And this is the end of the Wadi Watur. You can see here where it's washed out recently. Mm. Now, had you wondered as you were approaching this, where did that fire come down and separate the Egyptians from we the Israelites? We will see evidence of it. Really? Yes. Okay. We will show that to you. So here we're getting closer to the exit point of the Wadi. In the distance is the beach. And Past that, we can see in the distance now the water of the Gulf of Aqaba. Now, there's something on that beach, uh, modern, is there not? There's some kind of, there's some buildings there. There is, and we'll see that, yes. So there's the wadi we traveled through. We're now at the beach at Nueva. And now we're going to show you the second way to get to the beach, and this would be from Israel. If you, Here's a lot. It's Saturday evening. The day is, ev is ending, and the next morning we're going to head out through the Israeli exit point, and then go over into the Egyptian border station here. And so the, the, the Taba Gateway, and we had our driver waiting for <laughs> us, ready to take us. We're heading south about 50 miles, heading down to Nueva. And this is the Israeli way. This is from Israel, yes. Okay. You can get to it from Israel. And on the left, we can see the waters of the Gulf of Aqaba. So I'm here in the back seat. We see the water. Oh, there it is there, yeah. On the left, the Gulf of Aqaba. That is the Yom Suf, or Red Sea, spoken of in the Bible. There is the Pharaoh's Island, built in the 11th century by the Crusaders. I guess they were controlling movement through the area. Mm. It's very interesting castle. And here in Egypt, things are poorer compared to Israel, but a lot of vacant buildings, a lot of unemployed, but we're continuing to head south. Now, when was this video shot? This was November of 2016. Okay, so this is after all the unrest in the Arab Spring. Yes. And all the rest of it. Yes. And then there's Nueva, jutting out into the water, five miles long, three miles across, so it's hmm. large enough to hold three million people. That is larger than one imagines seeing the photos yes. from the aerial view. In the background there is the Wadi Watur we came out of, okay. emptied out onto the beach here. This is from our hotel, hmm. and you can see the Wadi Watur right there. So this is what, uh, minus the buildings of course, this is what the Israelites saw. Yes. When they some, looked back and saw yeah. the Egyptians coming. Some have called this Piharoth, mouth of the hole or canyon, hmm. which is... You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a major point to make note of because you're exiting the mountains. So it may be Piharoth. And then here is sunrise the next morning. Mm. You can see the beautiful mountains over there in Saudi Arabia and the sun coming up over the mountains. So very interesting. 
It's nice to be right there at the Red Sea crossing. And here we're panning across. You can see the mountains of Saudi Arabia. So that's where they are going, but they have no idea how they're going to get across. How can you imagine it. being on that beach, looking yes. at that, saying, Moses, what have you done? No wonder they thought that we're yes. dead. Right. But of course, Moses had full faith in God, that God would do something. He didn't know exactly what. But So here we are, taking a look. Heading, that's a viewing to the north. Our guide wanted us to come to his house for breakfast. He had his goats out front. Oh. <laughs> Trusty old goats to eat the trash. <laughs> and so our driver here on the left, we're here at Nueva. So can people go out there like you did as on a, some kind of tour, or is this just something, an anomaly that you did and happened to find a driver who was willing to do it? Well, I don't know of any tours going there, you know, formal tours, but it's mainly individuals that are going. We had to go through like six checkpoints to get to the spot. Uh, so the you've got to be dedicated. You've got to yeah. have a reason for going out yes. there. And there's so much uh, military there on the way to the New Way, but it can turn off a lot of visitors, tourists, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's what one of the hotel owners said. So here, our guide was giving us some tea, and then we headed out from here. We were going to head over to the pillar that marks the spot there ah, okay. at New Weba. And you can see the poor area of town, the Bedouins living. Now this this is the the pillar that has been eroded over time, not yes. the ones that the Saudis found on the other side, which was pretty much intact. Right. This will be the Egyptian pillar we're heading toward, and uh, it was found lying in the water. Here we can see it in the distance, next to the road, in the center of the video. Oh, there it is erected there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Ron Wyatt showed it to the authorities in 1978. The Israelis were occupying the Sinai Peninsula. He showed it to them. They brought it back from the water's edge and set it up in concrete, which was very nice. So today you can go there and stand beside this pillar. And that's all thanks to Ron Wyatt. Uh, yeah, <laughs> essentially. And, and Solomon, who, who erected it to start with. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so uh, the matching column on the Saudi Arabian side had Hebrew writing on it still when Ron found it in 1984. It said, Solomon, Pharaoh, Yahweh, death, Mizram, which means Egypt, mm -hmm. um, water, Edom. So this was a marker marking the Red Sea crossing spot. And oh, and this, some, someone has made their own markings on it. Yes, apparently. unfortunately, but uh, modern graffiti. But um, Solomon Seaport, Elath, was 50 miles to the north there at modern day Elat. And so Solomon... This was his area. This was his neighborhood. And so 400 years after the fact, he had these column, columns erected to mark the spot of the Red Sea crossing. He knew full well where this event took place. So that must have been passed down from family to family. Yeah, sure. Yep. So it's a 16-foot red granite Phoenician-style column. Beautiful and there's obviously no writing on there. That's all been washed off now. The back side of it has been eroded away. It doesn't look this nice. And that's where probably some writing was. Mm. But that is, that's a solid piece of granite. That's not like yes. the Sodom and Gomorrah limestone that we saw. This is, right. it's, uh, this is very solid red mm -hmm. granite. It's very beautiful. So from here, we can get a look at where this is in relation to the water. It's set back. The water's a couple hundred yards away. And this is the beach here, essentially. Yeah, this is the crossing area right here where the water actually opened up. Wow. Yes. It's amazing to stand here. Now, is there uh, a definite place on the other side that we can match up as to where yes. from the beach? The column that was cut down in Saudi Arabia, the base of it is still there. Oh, okay. So if you, if you line these up, it's 13 miles across the water. Mm. Yes. So we're traveling through the local Bedouin village here. But up to the north, before we head down to the crossing site, up to the north is Migdal, or fortress, um, that is at the narrowest point where the water and mountains come together, is this fortress. And I, I imagine it was designed to limit the travelers going up and down through the beach there, heading north or south. And so this was some type of Egyptian fortress designed to control movement through the area. And inside the fort 
here, they had a nice well dug that uh, would serve the soldiers here in the nice fort. And so some of the locals were following us in here and they were showing us this well that the soldiers would have used. And some kids sitting precariously on the edge. Yeah, I'm afraid they might <laughs> fall in there. And so we can look down and we can see a little bit of the water. Mm. And so that would have served them. So this was probably Migdal. And now we're getting ready to head back south to the actual crossing site. And here you can see the beach where the waters opened up. We're standing at the exact spot. Wow. Yes, and the mountains of Saudi Arabia in the distance. Did your knees get weak sitting there? Was it, a, <laughs> was it a, a, an awesome thing to behold? It was quite behold? incredible, yes, to, to be there. Mm. And so in the foreground, right in front of us here, is a melted beach where the sand and the stones were literally melted together like concrete. Really? This is not loose sand. This is a melted beach which the pillar of fire created when it stood here. So Separating the Egyptian army yeah. from the fleeing Israelites. Yeah. So again, this is more evidence you know, that confirms the location My here. My goodness. Now, how did you find out about that? I had heard about it, and then I, I saw it myself. You know. So here it is. You see this rock is just infused in with the sand and the little rocks there. And this is all hardened. This is like concrete. That and is amazing. Jason here is stepping on it. It's, it's very solid. This is a different area. How did the locals explain this? I asked the, local, the hotel owner was here with us that we know, and he says, I've never seen this before. You know, he said his hotel's in a different area, but you know, he was amazed at what he saw. So, uh, well, there's the evidence right there. It's yeah, solid. Right, and so a piece of it was broken off for us to look at. And you can see up close here, all the little rocks and the sand, they're melted together, infused wow. by the pillar of fire. And this goes on for some ways. This isn't just one little spot. And so Ron Wyatt went, went scuba diving out there and various things have been found in the water. You can see human femur bone that is coral encrusted, which would be something you would expect. And on the left here, we see a normal one on the right you see the coral encrusted femur from one of the soldiers. On the top left, you see a human rib cage stuck in the coral. Now, what about people who say, oh, this is just, this is table coral? It's, it's just... It, it's not, because it has metal in it. And so here's a horse's mm. hoof. It's shriveled up when they took it out of the water. Mm -hmm. It's shriveled up. So, again, we have horse parts, human parts. What are we seeing here? What is this coral? Uh... And so this is coral standing on an axle, and it has a raised center hub with spokes going outwards. Here's another round chariot with a raised center hub and then spokes going out, and it's got a round shape to it. Again, it's covered in coral. Do some people say that these are just modern shipwrecks? Some people have said that, but again, this agrees totally with the design of the chariot wheels. Mm. With a raised center hub and using metal detectors, there is metal in the center there are spokes going out. This is a four-spoke wheel with three spokes left. Four-spoke wheels, six-spoke wheels, and eight-spoke wheels are found here. Hmm. Of course, using the metal detector, like he's demonstrating here, all the hubs here contain metal, and that is the design of the Egyptian chariot wheel with the metal center hub. Now, here is a gold-plated wheel. There were 600 choice chariots used in the Exodus, we're told, so you would expect to find 1,200 uh, chariot wheels here with gold and this one is special it's gold plated and two or three of these were found by Mr. Wyatt hmm. now we see a more shallow area where the Red Sea crossing took place it's shallower here compared to the north and compared to the south it's still deep it has to be a deep area it's 2800 feet deep but that gives you a 4% grade which is manageable over in Saudi Arabia you see the remains of the pillar uh, that was found there on the Saudi Arabian side. It was cut down by the Saudi authorities. It had Hebrew writing on it. We don't know where it is. But there in the Saudi waters, Vivica Ponton went scuba diving and she found this beautiful chariot wheel in the Saudi Arabian waters. So you have chariot parts on the Egyptian side, chariot parts on the Saudi Arabian side. So but it's not the crossing site. 
It couldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the critics would say. But uh, you know, the evidence is here. It's real. So we rented a boat and went out with a Rove, a remote-operated vehicle. Uh, had a 100-foot tether, and so we were going to do some little inspecting ourselves. So this is a submarine camera? Yes, for okay. a few hours. And we didn't have days and weeks to do this, but we had a few hours. We rented a nice boat here to take off. We headed down toward the south end of the beach. We're headed toward that area, and you can see the waters uh, extending over to Saudi Arabia in the distance. And... So were you stopped by the Saudi authorities like uh, Leonard Mueller was? They, sometimes they do, yeah. If they suspect <laughs> you, they'll come over and see what you're up to. Mm. But uh, so now we're in the approximate area, and we're going we're gonna to throw the drone into the water. So are you closest to what, which land is that we're there? We're close to Egypt close here, to Egypt. Saudi, right. uh, excuse me, Sinai okay. Peninsula. So we're getting it ready for another launching here. So here's the camera. It's got three propellers. Um, and it's giving us a live feed back up into the boat. And uh, so that day we were able to see something. I looked around, but we couldn't confirm that it was a chariot wheel. So here we're launching it. And then here's an instant replay on board the Rove. The Rove's videoing this. And so we're down in the water. So where you are is not that deep where you are right here. Right. Close it's, to the it's land. It's not that deep, yes. And so you can see some coral parts here. But again, coral doesn't grow on sand. That's there has true. to be it something to, to, to grow to something, on. Yes. Mm -hmm. So obviously there has to be something down there. Yes. But this area is very remote. I wouldn't imagine that it's, you know, pieces from human, uh, from modern humans, because why would they be there? There's, there's nothing there. Yes. So some of these objects here may be from the, uh, you know, the Pharaoh's Armory. We can't tell for sure. This is fascinating. So we have the, the video from the Red Sea Crossing. Thank you for showing us your, your trip down there. Uh, after the break, we are going to come back and uh, talk about Mount Sinai, what's on the other side of the Red Sea Crossing. So we look forward to that. For more than 20 years, Ron Wyatt spent his life and his life savings on researching and finding the real Mount Sinai, Sodom and Gomorrah, Noah's Ark, and the Ark of the Covenant. Discover the amazing truth of Ron Wyatt's discoveries in a special series from A Rude Awakening International, A.D. Archaeology Discovered. Special guest Kevin Fisher walks you through every discovery in detail, including his personal verification that the sites Ron Wyatt found are real. The, you can see the four major discoveries, the Noah's Ark, Red Sea Crossing, Mount Sinai, Solomon and Gomorrah, those are visible things. Right now, you can order this fascinating series on DVD and Blu-ray. You'll get all four episodes as seen on Shabbat Night Live. It's not for us. God has a timing for this. It's not for us to force the issue, you know, to try to bring it out. So, Israeli authority, they know it's there. Order AD, Archaeology Discovered. Order online or by phone. And welcome back. If you decided to support our ministry, thank you very much for doing so. You can donate anytime by going to rootawakening.tv or 888-766-3610. Again, thank you very much. Now, we're with Kevin Fisher from Ark Discovery International, and we meant to get into uh, something before the break, and that was uh, Kadesh Barnea. We're going to talk a little bit about that and then get into Mount Sinai. But tell us about, tell us about uh, Kadesh Barnea. This is the second location where Moses struck the rock. But okay, hold made, on, hold made, on. Second, lo wait a minute. Yes. Second right. location. Yes. What's that about? Well, the first location was in Mount Sinai. Okay. He was told to strike the rock, which he did. It split, and the water came out. Well, they moved over to the Kadesh Barnea area, and he was told to speak to the rock. But instead, out of basically anger, he struck the rock, and the water came out. And so there's an area about 30 miles southwest of the Dead Sea that Mr. White found that he believes is the Kadesh Barnea site, where you can see a large amount of water erosion coming down the base of the mountain right there. So to get to the site, you have to drive out in the desert there, drive down some uh, rocky roads. And in this first image here, we're getting out of our rental vehicle, or Avis. I'm, I'm sorry, Avis. But uh, <laughs> going down these little rough roads, and we finally got to a stop. We couldn't go any further. And so you walk about two miles through the desert mm -hmm. to get to this mountainous area. 
Okay. We and see the it distance there. is the area we'll be taking a look at. But you can see it's rather flat out here. Mm -hmm. This would have been kind of the area where the children of Israel would have camped. Plenty of uh, level area here. And then uh, this is a site where the water erosion is. Uh, you can see someone standing here. Uh, to the right of this individual is the site we'll be taking a look at where there's the most water erosion. But this is the site where Moses struck the rock. Now, in the next slide here, we can see a large amount of erosion coming down the mountain. It's eroded away. Okay. This, this rock, I mean, these are large cutouts in the rock caused by a lot of water. This isn't a trickle of water, but uh, a real gully washer coming down here constantly, eroding away the rock into channels. There's actually large channels here as deep as six feet going down. And in the distance here in the left, uh, with the individuals next to the stone, that is a baffle rock stone, they call it, where it was approximately six feet deep there, the channel that was being cut out, and the children of Israel stuck this rock down in the channel to force the water out, to spread out the water, basically. Okay. Like a dam, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, here you can see the eroded areas. Oh, still these some are, pools there. Yeah, yeah, these are deep. Apparently there have been a light recent rain here in, in this particular case uh, when we were there. And again, you can see more of the eroded areas mm -hmm. of the rock, more evidence of a large amount of water creating these deep channels coming down. And here we're looking down, down the side of the rock here, more of the deep channels. So is this recognized by anyone as being this site? It's not officially recognized. Again, hmm. this, is, this is one of the discoveries that's not recognized by the majority. And the next slide here, we see the deep channel, about six feet deep, where the baffle rock was hmm. placed in here, uh, strategically placed. It's a wedge-shaped rock forced straight down in there. And then here's the back side of it. You can see again. Oh, that is a massive stone yes. when you see it from that angle. It's very large, and it's wedged vertically mm. in there, you know, like it was placed uh, by the human hand in some way or another. Yeah. So, uh, and just above this, we'll take a look to the right of this, but again, you can see the baffle rock, and then where the water would have run downhill, out into the encampment to... Mm to give refreshing water to the children of Israel. Now, have there been any uh, artifacts found out there, like some pottery well, and things? Well, and Ron White did find some pottery, uh, grinding millstone mm. uh, out there. So artifacts have been found in this the encampment area. So regardless of what you want to believe, people did live there at yes, some point. Yes, there's evidence, yes. And using Ron's subsurface interface radar and uh, gold detecting equipment, he did find an area where he was getting a reading for gold, where mm. some of the people could have been buried uh, in that encampment area. Oh, so this may be, so they wore their gold, uh, and so this is a cemetery. After they, they were buried, they, they wore their gold yes, to yes. their death. So some, okay. Yes, some were buried with their gold. So again, this is a distant view. We can mm. see way out in the valley there. And just above this site, above where the baffle rock is, we can see an area in this hmm. spot. This is probably 40 feet from the Baffle Rock and this area here. This appears to have been the area of the source of the water that was coming out. And here you can see the exact hole. It appears that water was shooting out of this hole and running downhill. Um, and you can see the water here. The rocks here have been worn smooth. But uh, so that's the Kadesh Barnea that Ron Wyatt believes is the real site of the event or where Moses sinned. The second striking of the, the rock. The second, yes. A different location. Yes. Interesting. All, All right. right. All right. Well, we're going to get into Mount Sinai now. We have another uh, interesting presentation here, uh, Kevin. So uh, tell us about Mount Sinai. So this is a photo taken in Saudi Arabia looking back across over to Egypt. This would be a sunset photo. You can see the nice palm trees here in the foreground. But some people are probably asking, why are you over in Saudi Arabia? The reason we're in Saudi Arabia, as we can see on the map here, mm -hmm. is because the Red Sea crossing that we saw earlier is found at the Nueva Beach mm -hmm. in the Sinai Peninsula. 
and it's in the Gulf of Aqaba. And Midian is where Mount Sinai should be. Midian is in Saudi Arabia, near the mountain here, Mount Sinai. All maps that are historically accurate will show Midian over here in this area of Saudi Arabia. Midian is where Moses fled to, to escape the um, punishment of killing the Egyptian. And 40 years later, he was at the mountain of God. And because you will worship me on this mountain. Yes, he was to bring the children of Israel back to this mountain, the pillar, the fire incident with the burning bush. Mm -hmm. So he was in Midian at that point, and he was to bring the people back to that location. So we want to be looking in Saudi Arabia. So, you know, what I find interesting too is even though you know Ron Wyatt and Michael Rood and others say it's here, they're not the only ones. Uh, you have on your website some other quotes from some very knowledgeable and notable people. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, Dr. Roy Knudsen, he's a professor of a professor of biblical archaeology, says the visible evidence is quite overwhelming that the location of the true Mount Sinai has been discovered in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Uh, Herschel Shanks, you mentioned uh, Herschel Shanks uh, to me when we were talking before the program. Um, he says Jabal al-Laz is most likely the site for Mount Sinai. And then Dr. Dean McKenzie, who is a professor emeritus at the University of Oregon, says the evidence points to northwest Saudi Arabia as the location of the actual Mount Sinai. Yeah, so there are, quote, authorities out there that are agreeing, yes, this is the correct mountain. And this is the place where Ron, he crossed the border in 1984 on foot <laughs> from Jordan into Saudi Arabia, he and his sons, and they walked through the desert. It was a very strenuous uh, hike for them, and that's when he was uh, taken prisoner, supposedly you know, being accused of being an Israeli spy. But uh, Ron Wyatt found this mountain there, and he asked the locals, and the locals said, Jabal Musa Hena, hmm. or the Mountain of Moses, is here. And so you've got a local tradition out there that, yes, this is the Mountain of Moses. And, of course, they do respect uh, Moses, uh, the Muslims do. Now, there's two names there, Jabal al-Laz and Jabal Musa? The yeah, Jabal Musa Hena. They call Musa it the Mountain of Moses. Okay. Yeah, is what, is what they call it. And we're talking it. about the same place. Yes, same, same place. Same okay. as Jabal al-Laz, yes. And so here is the beach on the Saudi Arabian side of the crossing site there. Where the Israelites came over yep, yes. from Nueva. And that's where we saw in the previous segment where the chariot wheel was found. Ah, okay. In these, in these waters here, so this is a continuation of the crossing site. And so from the beach area, you can also see the where the column was cut down. The column that had the writing on it, uh, death, misroom, uh, Pharaoh, Yahweh, Solomon, mm. water. So this was a column marking the spot for the Red Sea crossing. The authorities cut it down and took it someplace. We don't know where it is. And we, you know, what's interesting, there's a two columns and people might say, oh, well, that's just each culture had their own had their own uh, traditions of raising columns for this and that. But these are matching columns. They're the same granite. Yes, they're from opposite sides of the crossing site, strategically placed, and then you have the chariot parts in these same waters. Mm. So they were placed there on purpose, you know, for a reason. Pillars were used, you know, in ancient times to mark places or events. And so, you know, we can trust uh, these columns in this particular case. Mm. Solomon Seaport was just to the north. He knew of this area, what was going on here. So in our next slide here, we can see Tim Mahoney in the foreground, and in the background, uh, you can see the split rock, the first split uh -huh, rock. Yes, okay. So we went from the second one back to the first one here. And of course, Tim Mahoney, he is with the website PatternsOfEvidence.com. They're putting together a documentary on this and the Red Sea Crossing. But you can see in the distance the split rock on top of a 300 foot tall hill. The split rock is 50 feet in height. It's very prominent rock. Now in Numbers 2011, and Moses lifted up his hand and with his rod he smote the rock twice and the water came out abundantly and a congregation drank and their beasts also. So God provided for them. He gave them provision and... Water for a million people. Uh, yes. And probably several million yes, animals. Probably three, you know, three million people, yeah, plus their livestock. So... 
Some people have been able to make it over there. The country is closed. You cannot get a tourist visa. So to get into the country is very difficult. And then getting out to the site, you have to have permits usually just to get to that area. But uh, here you can see the split rock where you can see a large amount of water erosion. A large amount of water erosion coming down from the rock. In the foreground here, you can see channels being cut into the rock. The water has eroded the, the rock to a smooth surface here. And this is the rock that in modern Western times that uh, Jim and Penny Caldwell, I mean, the Bedouin have always known this is, this is here, mm -hmm. but this is where uh, ben, uh, Jim and Penny Caldwell discovered this one. Yes. After Ron discovered the mountain, Jim and Penny went out there and they also found this rock. Uh, but uh, so very, very large rock. The split in the rock is so large you can actually walk through it. Mm. You know, and a large amount of water erosion inside the rock itself. Here you can see how it stands out prominently above the peak there. And so here you can see the split in the rock where a person could walk through it. When God split it, it sure split, and then the water erosion coming up out of there, spewing up, it created more space probably in the rock, eroding it away. And you can see water erosion coming down from the rock. Yeah, and even if you saw this and you were a skeptic and said, well, that rock has always been split, or it's just a, it's a natural outcropping, and that erosion is wind erosion, well, you're not going to have wind erosion da flowing down uh, in a pattern similar to what water would create. Yes, this is definitely water erosion coming down. Again, this is a desert area, very little rainfall at all out here, and yet all this water erosion you can see on the rocks coming down from this giant split rock. So God did provide hmm. water for them lovingly, even though they were impatient and Rebellious, kind of like us, I guess. <laughs> Aren't we all? Yes. Yeah. So in our next slide, you can see Ross Patterson. He's standing uh, next to the split there in the rock. Now, those who are not familiar with Ross Patterson, uh, who, who is he in relation to He's all of this? He's a friend of mine in New Zealand who okay. also promotes Ron Wyatt's work. Oh, very good. presentations, and he was able to make it out there. And so our next slide, we can see the altar Jehovah Nisi in the foreground. Mm. Um, and in the background, we can see the split rock once again, standing up, very prominent rock in the background. And uh, So this is an altar of some this kind This mentioned here. in the Bible, mm -hmm. yes, this altar. So again, this is matching the biblical account once again. And there's also some circular rock formations. I don't know if they held the bottoms of the tents down or something, but mm. you see some round rock formations the children of Israel were encamped in this so that's, area. That's similar to what we find in North America with the uh, Cherokee Indians uh, and, and such across the country, that in certain areas where they would camp, they, they, there's these circles where their tents were Okay, yeah, uh, at GPs, different times yeah. of the year. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So over on the other side of the mountain is the front of Mount Sinai, and you can see in the distance the blackened peak mm. of the mountain. Uh, once again, the Bible says that the mountain was a smoke, it was on fire, and so the mountaintop here is on, is blackened. When you walk up to the top of the mountain, several people have, you turn the stone over, the top of it's black, the bottom of it is brown. Really? So there's evidence that it was burned on top, and the natural color is on the bottom, and it's brown. Now that answers a question I was going to ask, and you've already answered it, because I have heard a, a secondary theory that this is just a different type of rock. It's a black rock that happens to have this, this, uh, this line uh, right at a certain point uh, near the peak. Yeah, but that's not the case. Yeah, this is a burned mountaintop, hmm. because underneath it, you know, it is brown material. So it's actually a, a day hike to make it to the top of the mountain and to make it back down. Uh, you know, strenuous walk, but people have been up there and they've seen the blackened, uh, burned. And that is the tallest mountain in the area. It is. The upper two-thirds of Saudi Arabia is the tallest of mountains, and that's another clue that ancient historians have said that it was the tallest mm. of mountains in Midian, and that's what it is. Here it is from Josephus. We were just looking at that now. Uh, so yeah. Josephus said that Mount Sinai was the highest of mountains in, this, in the city of Midian, which is just outside of Al-Bad. Yes, Al-Bad is 15 miles to the south. Okay. And Al-Bad is where Jethro is from. On some maps, you'll see the name Jethro next to Al-Bad. 
hmm. and the uh, caves of Moses are there also um, at Albod. And, so. it, and also uh, Philo said that Mount Sinai was located east of the Sinai Peninsula and south of Palestine, which yes. puts it again in this right. vicinity. Again, we're in the correct location. So you have all these ancient historians identifying the site, and you have the Bible saying hmm. uh, Mount Sinai in Arabia, Galatians 4. So it's pretty incredible. It's been lost for so many uh, millennia, and yet here it is coming out in, hmm. uh, near the end of time for a de demonstration of truth for mankind. So Exodus 19, and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as a smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. My friend Aaron Sin was out there around 2003 with Tim Mahoney, and again, you can see the blackened peak in the background, and at the base of the mountain, we'll see a little bit later, is the remains of an altar, uh, once again, fitting the biblical account. You can see a guard house on the right edge of this photo. They put mm -hmm. a fence around the front of the mountain and a guard house and a sign telling people to stay away. This is an archaeological area. So the Saudi authorities are recognizing this as an archaeological site. Well, having put that much effort into it, they know. Yes. They know darn well sure. what this is. Sure. And then another photo here from a distance further back from the mountain. You can see, uh, again, the encampment area. And the left side of the photo in the distance, that's an area where Elijah's cave is. And here in the very center of the photo is Elijah's cave. It's uh, in a shadow. But it's in the, kind of the very center of the photo here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can see it there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he, Elijah, arose, he did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the man of God, and he came thither unto a cave and lodged there, First Kings 19. Now how many people would catch on to that, that this is the same? Because we hear of Elijah's cave, but we, normally you wouldn't tie the two together. You wouldn't stop at Mount Horeb. Oh yes, that's right, that's, this is the same place. You know, it's, it's funny right. that it's just all in the right. same area. Everything matches here, you know, the biblical account. And this is taken from inside the cave, and we're looking out into the valley below. This is quite a photograph here. Mm, wow. Now, that is, now there in the photo, you can see the, that's the Saudi government's buildings. Is it not? Well, actually, those are Bedouin buildings Bedouin out buildings. in the, in the okay. far distance. But just in front of that, toward the mountain a little bit, is the fence. Fencing they put up, the okay. Saudi, Saudi authorities, yeah, to keep people out. And there's all kinds of things down there. There's, a, there's even a, a modified corral of types. There is, yeah, remains of an altar, um, remains of pillars at the base of the mountain. And here's another photo of the cave. It's not real deep, but nevertheless, it is something mm. to provide shelter from the rain and so forth. Now, Google Earth, you can look about 20 miles southwest of here, and you can see Elam. Elam was where there were 12 wells and 70 palm trees, we're told. And if you go there today, there are still 12 wells at this site. So this is no doubt Elam. Yes. So this is, again, confirmation we're in the right area. And, uh, and it's on the right trail. It's, it's on, yes. the, on the way, is it not? Yes, it is. Right. And so we're back at uh, Mount Sinai again, and uh, Ross Patterson is pointing to a spot in the distance this is where the golden calf incident took place. Mm. We're going to see that shortly. But this will give you an idea of how Moses is coming down the mountain and he could have seen the dancing mm. and the, the apostasy taking place. And, of course, his anger became hot, righteous indignation against the apostasy of the people. In Exodus 32, and it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. So that's what he saw. And here we can see, this is an aerial view of the large rocks where the golden calf was placed on top of this. The Saudi authorities, they have placed a fence around this once again, and there's a sign saying this is an archeological area, mm. stay out. And the clue is that there are 
paintings on the side that are not indicative of that area, are they? That's right. You've been there, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen photographs. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. So here we are. This is a closer shot of it. And on the sides of this, as you say, there are inscriptions of the, the Apis bull uh, and so forth on the side of this from Egypt. Mm -hmm. So they came from Egypt. They're accustomed to this you know, Egyptian bull designs and so forth. And here Ross is next to one of them. Uh, on and that is not native to that area. Right, That's right. That's the key. The, the Saudi locals you know, do not draw this type of Egyptian drawing on the rocks you know, in their area. So this is something brought over from Egypt, these designs and so forth. So, and then Ross is next to some other carvings mm. here, more bulls and calves, and you see a camel and so forth. So, a lot more inscriptions here showing people were here, and again, it's tied back to Egypt. Now, how long ago was this that you could get that close to this? Because you can't do that anymore. Right, you can't get a tourist visa. You have to get some sort of special permission from the government. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can't just send in an application for a tourist visa. You have to get a special permit, and that's extremely difficult. And you would hop, have to hop the fence now, too, to get this kind of photograph. Yes, to get inside some of these areas, you can, you can go around the fence. Some of them have. But, they're, of course, they're not damaging anything. Mm. You know, they're keeping everything pristine. So, and here are some more drawings. Ross is next to. This is out in the encampment area. Oh, so this is not at the altar itself. There are more of these. These are, yeah, these are a little bit away from the actual golden calf altar. These right here. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then this is Dr. Kim, who was out there, went out there 12 times. He worked for the Saudi prince, and he found numerous drawings out here also. He also found these artifacts, incredible amount of pottery and so forth in the encampment area. And he was, a, wasn't he a personal uh, he physician was, to, he the, to the king? He was to one of the princes, oh, yes. Princes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then he found, if you can see here, the arrow's pointing to a menorah. He wow. found an inscription of a menorah where it was actually made there at Mount Sinai, the, you know, the, the golden candlestick. Mm -hmm. So this is where it was made, and this is the oldest image ever of the menorah or golden candlestick. He, and again, he even, found if, it there. even if you were to argue that, what would a Hebrew inscription be doing in the middle of a Muslim Arab country. Exactly, yeah. This is showing the Jewish roots of these drawings out there and of the people that were there. And then Ron Wyatt found this millstone in the encampment area. Once again, mm -hmm. evidence of the people occupying, and this would have been used with manna, grinding up the manna. So this is, you know, a manna stone, so to speak. Wow, Pretty absolutely incredible. amazing. Well, you know what, we're going to have to cut it short, uh, Kevin. But you know what, we're going to come back. We're going to come back because we have a lot more to talk about. We've covered uh, several very interesting, fascinating topi topics so far. And we're going to come back uh, next episode with the Ark of the Covenant. So we'll talk to you more about that. And in the meantime, thank you for watching. Uh, please support this program. You are our only means of support. Uh, there are no corporate sponsors. You make it happen. So uh, go online to arudeawakening.tv slash give, and you can give there or give us a call at 888-766-3610. Until then, next week, we will see you. Shalom, and we'll be back.